Hi everyone, welcome to Balancing Online and Offline Learning at Home, a webinar by Khan Academy Kids and Tinker Garden. Before we go any further, I want to thank our sponsors, AT&T, Google.org, Novartis, Bank of America, and Fastly for their support for our school closure parent resources. I am Sophie Turnbull. I'm on the Khan Academy Kids team, and I'm joined by Lauren Kwan, who's also on the Khan Academy team, and our special guest today, Megan Fitzgerald from Tinker Garden, who I can't wait for you to meet. Today, we are going to talk about one of the big questions on lots of parents' minds, and that is, how might we balance online and offline learning in an era of school closures? We're going to share with you some resources that are available for free that you can access to help guide online and offline learning. What we're not going to do today is go into vast amounts of detail on how to sign up and set up Khan Academy Kids. And we won't walk through the teacher experience on Khan Academy Kids, but if you go to your handout, that is a PDF available linked to this webinar, you can access the links to both of those modules and you can learn about that. What we will do is spend a few minutes talking about Khan Academy Kids. Most of the time, I'm so excited to say we'll be spent talking about Tinker Garden, and then we'll leave a good amount of time, say 10 minutes at the end, to go through Q&A. Khan Academy Kids is a free app for two to seven-year-olds that includes a range of activities that cover social emotional learning, reading, language, math, physical play, creative activities. It's all housed in this app and guided by our five original characters and you can download it in your app store and it is really designed to give your child a diverse range of online learning opportunities that are interactive, that are playful, that are colorful. Uh, it's not designed to suck them into the screen and capture them there. And it is all aligned to Head Start and Common Core standards. Here's just a snapshot of some of these online activities in the Khan Academy Kids app. You'll see there's books, there's time telling, there's math. There's a whole library of self-serve activities available for you in the Khan Academy Kids app. But one of the big questions that we've got from families, especially those families who are in love with our app, is how do we make it a part of our day? How do we structure our day so that Khan Academy Kids fits in with a range of other important things like playtime and going outside? And on the handout here, there is a link to the Khan Academy schedules. There are schedules from preschool right up through to the end of high school, and that's the link on the left. And the link on the right in the yellow box will actually take you to some really special schedules that we've developed, especially for two to seven year olds by the Khan Academy kids teams. Another thing that we've been working on during school closures that you might wanna take a look at that's outside of the Khan Academy kids app is something called Circle Time, which is a 10 to 15 minute session each day where we present a book and an activity based on the Khan Academy kids characters. And if you go on to our website, which we'll link in this handout, you'll also find some downloadable printables and they're designed with a daily theme and they're designed to keep the magic of our characters alive, but in an offline printable form, if that might suit your child. So I, we come back to this question though, with all of these amazing resources in Khan Academy Kids, how do we make it part of a balanced learning diet as some have referred to it as for our kids? And that's why I'm so excited to introduce and host today, Megan Fitzgerald. Megan is a mom of three, she is a teacher, she is a school leader, and she is the co-founder of Tinker Garden, which is an amazing programmatic approach to play that I am going to introduce now. Thank you, I'm so glad to be here. And I am also a Khan Academy Kids and Khan Academy Mom. So honored to be talking about this in with your team as well. Um, and so grateful for those resources. So yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, you're welcome. So I can tell you a little bit for those who don't know Tinker Garden. Uh, Tinker Garden is seeking to solve 
a problem that so many of us have. We all, many of us agree that spending time outside and purposeful time at play are so important for kids now more than ever, but knowing exactly what to do with play and exactly what to do outside to make that time really count for learners in the early years isn't always as easy as it sounds. So that's why we started Tinker Garden and my husband and I co-founded Tinker Garden. He's a technologist and I'm an educator thinking about how we could help families really make the most of early learning years by helping their children do what they naturally do, which is play and learn through play and to make the most of the wonder and the sensory experiences and the hands-on learning that can be done outdoors together. And we developed a curriculum over the years and have tested that and that curriculum now is being used most of the time by thousands of amazing teachers who lead programs and lead the curriculum for families for kids aged six months to eight years old, right about the same age range as Khan Academy kids, but they do that in their local parks all around the country, so in all 50 states. But during this time, when it's not safe for all of us to get together in groups and in our local parks, we've launched a product called Tinker Garden at Home which is a free resource and set of resources for families. And that program delivers to anyone who's on the mailing list uh, it, once a week. And it gives families a do-it-yourself plan for play for that week. And we've designed our activities so they take the best of our curriculum, but put that simply in parents' hands, making it possible to create independent play experiences for kids using just what you have on hand and leveraging as much outdoors as you can, because for some of us and some of our Tinker Garden families, outdoors really has to happen inside. And we all have different types of green spaces and different types of safe access. So we've tried to make each week around a given theme. So you can see two of our themes here. One was building a water playground. And for a whole week, we looked at the sensory system and how to support that through water play. And we have activities that come each week that are for babies and toddlers, preschool age and school age kids. Another week you'll see last April 5th was about our hidden senses. So moving our muscles and changing the position of our head and how important that was. And through obstacle course play for all those different ages and different ways of doing that, we got those hidden senses activated for a whole week. So if you see on the calendar, families who are participating in the program get a weekly do-it-yourself activity plan. They we also can participate in a weekly live class uh, on Facebook where we can demonstrate how to get the play set up and started. And we have also blog posts and videos and tips that automatically come to parents that are designed to help both navigate this wild time as a parent, but also understand how this kind of play supports kids learning. And the final piece is community. So we celebrate every week and we have an ongoing, growing Facebook Live, uh, Facebook group that's called Outdoors All Four, where people share photos and ideas and tips. And it's a really wonderful place just to feel uh, connected during this time as well. And if you go to the next screen, you can see this is a bit of what the content looks like. There's a PDF to download every Sunday, and it comes with some background on the learning that we'll be looking at. This is this week's, which is looking at uh, play patterns in that children really show when they're engaged in play. And there's a main activity to do with your child and then about 12 to 15 extension activities by age group to keep you playing all throughout the week. Wow, this is amazing, Megan. Yeah, it's been fun. It's been so exciting to see it come to life in different parts it's all over the country. People are using it, in fact, even all over the world now because people can and it's available in English and Spanish. So lots of families putting this into life and bringing it to life in, in different parts of the country. So it's been very exciting to see and to be able to reach even more families than we could with our um, classes in the park. That's awesome. And one of the big questions that we were fielding a lot was, how do you strike that balance between the types of play that Tinker Garden at Home is structuring and say something like the online learning that the Khan Academy Kids app is supporting? Absolutely. And right now, so many parents, myself included, are thrust into this position where we need to fill our days for our children with really meaningful learning opportunities. And we have to do our, our own work. And what, no matter what that work is, we need time and our kids need really meaningful learning opportunities. So it's so important to be able to have both these incredible uh, resources like Khan Academy Kids that are 
interactive, high quality, age appropriate, that really help kids learn are lifelines to parents right now when we don't have our teachers in place. But at the same time, kids need a balance. And I think the schedules that Khan Academy kids have shared are really wonderful. And having a schedule is one really important way to balance the online and the offline. And just to look at how your day flows and make sure that there's a balance, that kids have time when they're on a screen using their sight and their sound mostly, but then also moving their bodies off screen, hands on, touching, smelling, um, you know, changing, using their big muscles. These are all really important things for turning on mind and body and for balancing their sensory systems. So as long as you have a good mix, but you also think about those transitions because for kids, it can be hard to transition and code switch between on screen and off screen. And I think a lot of adults look and see the sort of um, the sadness or the, the struggle that kids have when they transition off screens and think that that's a, a anything other than to be completely expected because it's really changing uh, what the kind of sensory experience they're having. So we found in our house it helpful to have real consistent time. So doing Khan Academy kids at the same time every day, having outside playtime at the same time every day, kids get used to the balance of those things. And little rituals where we close the screen, we plug it in, we say goodbye to our friends on Khan Academy kids, and then we try to leverage what was just going on into the play that we're gonna do outside. So kids just really need help transitioning in general. So I don't think that's any different about screen time, offline, online. And as long as you're mindful of that and you give them a really good balance, I think kids can come out with a wonderful day and you can have some time back um, for you, which you, everybody needs right now. Yeah, and, and speaking of that, I think I saw last week a really great piece about fostering independent play and parents really looking to build yeah. that skill in, in their child of being interested in playing on their own sometimes so that everyone has a little bit of time to get what they need to get done done. And how are you thinking about that during these school closures? Absolutely. Well, it's, it's essential for learners in general that they're able to be intrinsically motivated and that they can enter into a learning task and stick with it. But I don't think we've ever felt that need more acutely than right now when adults also need time and we can't be the playmate for our children all day and we are not trained to be teachers and even though I am trained to be a teacher there's no way I can do that for three children at different age levels and work and so it is not possible um, but independent play is what kids are designed to do as long as we can create the environment that supports it so one I have one really important way to do that is to literally set up your home environment or your yard or a play space so the kids really can engage in open-ended play. And every one of our Tinker Garden at Home activity sets help. Part of it is setting up the environment for the week and a theme that kids can continue to come back to. So once you set it up with them, then they really can have the latitude to play in open-ended ways that reflect their interests. And that is what's gonna have children stick with something. We also like to help parents understand what it means to invite children to play rather than direct them to play. And it sounds subtle, but it's a really important difference when children feel like they are invited and they're in charge. They will, just like us, probably stick with it and be much more motivated and driven in their play. And then another important thing is to pick a play program that's really designed to support kid-led independent play. And not all programs are, but ours, we embed learning science that we know engages children in self-directed play as we design our activities. So for example, we make sure that multiple senses are used because when children are using multiple senses, their brains are turned on and they're more likely to stick with it and they're more likely to benefit from the learning that they do. Um, if you looked at our uh, PDF from the last slide for this week, we're, we're in a series where we're introducing a new pattern in children's play. And researchers know that children repeat the same actions in their play, roughly about a year to six or seven years old. And those patterns are universal. No matter your culture, where you live in the world, children line things up in a row. Some children like to spin around and around and around and around. Um, and one of those uh, we was transforming. Kids love to mix, mash, blend, rip things apart, make new things. And we made potions last week as the main activity and then had many different ways for different ages to come at transforming or mixing and mashing things. 
And the play that we saw on our community forums was marvelous. Kids spending all week long making different potions, older children doing scientific experiments, babies just splashing and blending berries and water and every age group being able to enter wherever they were and being able to really stick with and, and develop this play throughout the week. So I love that. Well, maybe we can take a look at what it looks yeah. like. That's maybe the best way to see it is to see it in action. Cool. And what you'll see here is our week of obstacle course play to work our big muscles. You can see kids from all over the country, what they did on their own with whatever they had on hand, inside, outside. Mm. Uh, wonderful spirals. <laughs> And just the joy, I think, has been pretty sustaining for our team to be able to see that in the middle of all that's going on, this full body, full joy, kind of inventive play happening and our community inspiring each other. So these are shared on our Facebook group and we share these on every Friday. So families really are learning from one another. My kids are watching children and coming up with new ideas and putting them to use. So it's been a wonderful, even in this moment of distancing and feeling a bit overwhelmed by so many things, there are real bright lights of connection with our kids, our kids really having an, an opportunity to explore their interests and in play. Um, and I think that's one thing that both Khan Academy kids and the ability to sort of navigate through on your own as a child and this kind of play really allow for a silver lining in all of this that kids can really um, you know, kind of take off and, and run with what interests them the most. Great, thanks so much, Sophie and Megan, for sharing your expertise today. I'm sure so many parents and families will find it helpful. Great. Well, now we'd love to take time to get to some questions from our audience. Um, so before we do that, I wanted to do two things, ask two things of the audience members. One is to go ahead and grab the handout. It will have all the slides that you just saw, and you can find it in, the, in your GoToWebinar panel. There's a handout section that will have the PDF. Um, but if you're not able to access it there, no worries. We'll send it out via email as well. And our second ask is to actually have you ask your questions that you have for Megan and Sophie in the, the questions section of GoToWebinar. So we've had some, a lot of great questions come in as you all have been speaking. So Megan, I'm going to start with a question for you. And this question is from Laura. And she asks, how much average time per day should children be spending in independent play? Uh, if you could give some guidance there. Sure, that is a great question. And couple of short ways to think about it are first to really cue off of kids. If kids haven't been playing independently for very long, it might take them a while to build their stamina. They may still want to touch in with you a lot and that's okay. Um, sometimes kids are used to more structure, but if kids, I would uh, give them uh, at least a couple of blocks of time a day to break up the other activities that they're doing and then allow them to build their stamina over time. And then if you have a child who's really into something, I am not one to interrupt play. So really making sure that whatever's, whatever's pulling them out of the play is necessary. Um, and then in research, research would tell us that it takes half an hour for kids to really get into meaningful play, even little ones. So I would just make sure that the blocks that you give, make sure that they're at least half an hour from the point of when you really feel like you've invited a child and that may mean that they're lull a little bit or they may have quiet moments, but that's fine. That's where a lot of the inventive work happens in those quiet moments. So don't worry if kids are quiet, give them half an hour and I try and give them a couple blocks a day. Great, that, that's helpful. And somewhat related to that, we have a question from Shaw. Um, Shaw asks, how do I know the best time to intervene or interact in my child's free play? Sometimes they seem content, but I feel like I should be interacting with them. Absolutely. We have a great blog post about this, which is knowing when to talk, uh, when, knowing when to talk isn't child's play. And it's so tempting for us to um, really interact and we can and we should, but you can think about how to interact. So one of the things to think about is for little people, the cognitive load or the load on the brain to be part of a conversation is so much bigger than it is for Sophie and Laura and I right now. Um, and we're able to have conversation and multitask, but for kids who are really into their play, 
you often take them out of their play when you ask them to engage in conversation. So you can still show them that you're with them by simply sitting right near them and playing alongside them. Um, often just being right near them and waiting to see if they look up or engage you in conversation is an invitation in and of itself. And you are with them because they know you're there, but you haven't asked their brain to stop what they're doing to engage in a conversation with you. And I think about it like the yoga class I go to. I, my teacher stands right next to me and I very much know she's there and somehow my posture gets better and she doesn't have to do a thing. And you can think of yourself in that same way as a support just by by being there um, and then cue off of them. If they turn and engage you in conversation, go for it. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and another question about play we have from Karis Marie, uh, who asks, if you could give, could you give an example between inviting to play and directing to play? Yes, absolutely. So one of the things that we did a few weeks ago was we, our a whole week was dedicated to working with bed sheets or blankets. That's all you needed and what are the many, many things you could do. And one example that's classic is fort building. So I might say to my child, I wonder what we could build with this sheet, or I wonder how we could use this sheet to make a cozy place. Hmm, I wonder if we could do that. Using inquiry, leaving it open-ended, um, is, is, would be inviting that child into that play. And then part of inviting is also knowing that your invitation might be rejected for something better for that child, and that's okay. It's an invitation, it's not a, you know, a mandate or a direction. Whereas the direction might be, let's build a fort. Here, I'm gonna put the sheet here, you put that there, you put that there. And the resulting fort might then lead to wonderful invitations. But in that moment, the more you can use inquiry, the more you can use the wondering and sort of, or would you like to build a fort? What do you think? Even that's a better invitation because it allows that child to have some ownership over entering into that play and where it's gonna go from there. Great. Um, so we have a, some questions um, about uh, topics or subjects from, from Regina who asks, if, you're, if you aren't able to teach everything like school does, how do you narrow down what's most important? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it depends a bit on the age level of your child. Um, and so if they are at school age, which it sounds like from the question they are, I've been relying on asking the teachers sort of what the arcs were for the subjects for the rest of the year. You know, what were the important milestones and topics and then trying to find great resources like Khan Academy Kids to supplement for those, some of that content knowledge. And then in the balance, really working on social and emotional skills, imagination, language, problem solving through play. And I think as long as you allow children to pick what they're interested in and you allow them to use m multiple parts of their body and multiple and solve really interesting problems like how to build things and make things and imagine things, that to me is that what rounds out the child. So as long as you feel like you're addressing some of the content, keeping some of the learning, the reading, the math, um, moving that along, that rest of the time, we're all designed to be great supporters of play for our kids and great examples of how to communicate and how to solve problems together. So if you can keep those child, kid-led play opportunities coming, um, I think you have a really nice balance for this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and related to the topic of schedules, we have a couple of questions about that. Um, yeah. April asks, how do I develop a schedule for everyone in my house? Um, I have a 23 month old, three year old and seven year old. Um, mm -hmm. And Kelly also asked, um, do the activities provide suggestions for how to incorporate the play activi and activities for multiple kids of different ages? Sure. Um, so a couple of things to think about there are have broader blocks of time as opposed to very specific schedules. So we go outside during this part of the day we transition to screens for this part of the day. We um, we read quietly for this part of the day, and that might look like you reading to one, one you know, the others reading to themselves or listening. Or so, if you have broader categories, you can then figure out what that broader category looks like for those different ages at that same time. Um, that's what I'm doing. I have five, seven, and nine year olds, so a little closer than those, but still really different capacity, needs, interests. So. Um, so that's what has been helping us a lot, really broad categories of time, but kids get used to that and then they feel comfort in that structure. 
And then for play, it's actually quite easy. And a lot of the Tinker Garden, all of Tinker Garden activities um, are designed for multiple ages. So most of our classes, the most popular age range is from one and a half to eight in the same class. So that's the benefit of open-ended play. There are entry points for different ages within an open-ended play activity that make it possible for toddlers to come with their school-age siblings in class and both get exactly their needs met. And if you see the downloadable PDFs for Tinker Garden at home, you can see what extensions look like for babies and toddlers, preschool age and school age kids. So it gives you a sense of how you might give a twist on the play, the same kind of core play for different ages to keep them engaged. Awesome. Yeah. And I think we, we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. So, uh, so one question that we're hearing is from Nicolette um, says, I have limited resources in a small apartment. Do you feel a lot of the activities would still be usable? Uh, yeah. I have no apartment, no yard in our garage for storage of large items, but I'm really interested. Yes, well, our one of my colleagues and teammates would love this. He's actually in the middle of writing a blog post about what it's like to do play-based learning and independent play in Tinker Garden from her Brooklyn apartment. Uh, so we have many families who are in that situation where they have a very confined space. They're not able to go outside. So that's been one of our design challenges that we've um, willingly and lovingly accepted in Tinker Garden at home is that there are options for the activities that make them work with really truly what you have on hand and without being literally outside. Um, we've also have a great blog post that you should check out that is all about how to bring the outdoors in when you can't be outside. Um, and because so many of our families are in urban areas or in very dense areas and to be responsible and to be careful and loving of your of your family and your neighbors, you really can't be in each other's spaces all the time. So, you know, you can pull the table over by the window and that makes a tremendous difference. You can play nature sounds around you can bring next the one time of day that you go to the park, you can grab a few sticks and a few things from nature and have those as your play or your counting objects or your your toys for the day. Mix those in so that your, your kids are still getting that sort of hands on nature experience. And that makes a tremendous difference. Um, and there's great research for even just seeing pictures of nature is calming and helps kids focus. So there's many, many ways, Nicolette, that you can still be bringing a lot of outdoors into the inside. Um, so check out that in our blog as well. Great. Yeah. Uh, right, I have one question, one last question for, for you, Megan. So for, this is from Kimberly, um, who asks, during this time, I've noticed my daughter is clinging a bit more to me and it's been difficult for her to have that independent time. Could you suggest a helpful tactic on helping them feel like they can do it on their own? Absolutely. Um, first of all, that is to be completely expected. So uh, another blog post that comes out today is about this roller coaster ride and how kids are regressing and really clinging to us because they need a lot of attention and support because they're sensing the anxiety that we're all carrying as well. So it sounds like you're already just giving a lot of affection as long as that's the physical affection is in whatever way your daughter really receives it well lavish that on because it's a lot of that behavior is a is a is a cry for reassurance um so any time of day you can do that that's great and then when you are starting play uh, trying some of these activities doing a main activity together or setting up a play environment and then really inching your way back once she's really engaged so for example you might, if you're inside, you might take the block area, if you have blocks or any kind of building tool and just start a building a little bit and then back away and see if that invitation enough is enough to get her involved. And then you can either put bring your work and work alongside or do something else. It's like a parallel activity, just still be nearby. She may just need your presence, but allow her to lead herself through that play and that will help to build her stamina. Um, also, making sure that the play spaces that she is, you're visible, but you're working on something else. So kids have, uh, and, and computers don't qualify somehow. I feel like when I'm on a device, it's a license to interrupt me, but somehow physical work, whether you want to play also and use some play to, uh, tools yourself and play alongside, or if you want to bring you know, and something else that you're doing that's sort of your adult work with you and say, I'm going to work here and you're going to do your work there. Sometimes just creating that, having them know that you're right nearby will feed that need that's making them clingy and allow them the space to play. 
Fantastic. Well, this has been really helpful. And thanks so much, Megan and Sophie, for sharing your expertise and answering these questions from parents. Um, and we wanted to thank everyone for attending and for joining us today and for asking your fantastic questions. And keep an eye on your email. We'll be sending out a recording of, of this webinar as well as the slides. So you feel free to forward them on to any parents or friends you have that might be interested. And we also wanted to acknowledge it's, it's a challenging time and we appreciate all, all that all of you are doing for your families. And um, we think you're doing a fantastic job. And so thanks again for joining us and have a great week. Great. And thank you for having me. It was wonderful. And thank you for Khan Academy Kids. Right, thanks again. Bye. Bye. Thank you.